All right, I think we're good to get started. Alan, good on your end? All set. Okay. Um, so before we get started, I think Alan has a quick thank you um, just about you know how this this webinar even came about. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are in this world. Uh, we're very glad that you're joining us. Uh, we've been doing Friday webinar series uh, for the past several weeks. And in the past, we've been doing inspirational related webinars and business related webinars. This is the first one that we're doing um, sort of tackling uh, physical and, and uh, data security um, in response to the things that we're seeing out uh, with the protests around George Floyd's death. Um, the reason why this is happening, though, is because uh, Allegra Wild, who's a, a, a photo consultant and founder of an online portfolio company called IAST, approached us uh, online to say, hey, this is something that I think is very important personally. And she helped throw this together and sort of inspire us to do this. And this happened very, very quickly in the span of, of uh, several days. So we're very appreciative of Allegra for uh, keeping an eye out on the industry. Um, and thank you so much for that. Definitely. Um, and before we jump into questions, we just wanted to give our panelists um, the floor. Um, so Akili, if you don't mind just sharing a little bit about you and then we'll um, touch on Harlow and Frank's careers. Hi, thanks uh, for having me on this panel. It's a, quite an honor and uh, it's an important topic to discuss. Uh, currently, I am the executive director of the National Press Photographers Association. Uh, we've been in uh, around for almost 75 years as the voice of visual journalists. Um, prior to that, I've been in the news industry as a photo editor, photographer, uh, photo director, um, spanning several different companies. I've, I'll spare you the details of my resume. You can just Google it at some other time. But all that to say, I, I come from this uh, into this uh, with a background working uh, with uh, news in the news, uh, at, on the ground as a journalist and as an uh, as an editor, and hopefully taking charge of an organization that helps uh, continue being advocates for photojournalism. Definitely. And Harlow, do you mind sharing a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are across the globe. Uh, my name is Harlow Holmes, and I'm the Director of Digital Security at Freedom of the Press Foundation. We are a nonprofit uh, 501c3 organization founded in 2012 um, that uh, does uh, advocacy, um, does software development and digital security training and consulting and uh, security auditing for members of the press. Uh, our organization has pretty much, yeah, three parts. One um, is, you know, our engineering um, department, which uh, is based globally and we manage among a number of projects uh, a newsroom appliance which is called secure drop which allows um, uh, members of the public at large to anonymously send tips into uh, uh, newspapers that have this portal installed um, and it runs uh, entirely anonymously leveraging the tour um, network uh, I guess I can talk more about that if people are interested, but it's a great way to um, send anonymous tips into newsrooms. Uh, we also do uh, digital security training. So this is the uh, part of the organization that I lead where I and my small team, um, you know, uh, sit with journalists in newsrooms, large and small. Um, oh, there we go. Oops. We're good? Okay. Um, we sit with newsrooms, large and small, um, freelancers, documentary filmmakers, uh, and even from time to time photojournalists, not only on, you know, how to um, uh, uh, communicate with the press, uh, sorry, communicate with the public at large safely, but also, you know, things about like risky research, how to protect themselves online, how to um, protect their footage and, and, and things like that. And um, we wouldn't really be anywhere without, you know, what I think the third pillar is, which is our advocacy wing. So uh, we do a lot of special projects um, having to do with, you know, keeping the press free. So uh, our flagship project right now, um, our team who, uh, our intrepid team who's doing a lot of work over the past week is uh, the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker, which is um, a, a news outlet in and, in and of itself that reports on um, instances where members of the press have had their rights to report um, infringed upon. And uh, yeah, 
um, that's it. Happy to be here and happy to, um, looking forward to this conversation. Absolutely. And Frank, I know you've been quite busy on your end. So um, can you tell us a little bit about what you've been up to and, uh, you know, how kind of uh, global journalism got even started? Sure, excuse, Caitlin. Excuse um, I started uh, Global Journalist Security almost a decade ago uh, because I realized there was a need for more uh, better designed and tailored training that incorporated things like digital safety, which 10 years ago for journalists seemed like something quite novel, as well as psychological support and uh, resiliency and stress management. Um, before that, I worked with the Committee to Protect Journalists, so I'm familiar with cases in the United States of journalists getting arrested over the past 20 years and had the pleasure to work not with Alika, Aliki from NPPA, but with Mickey Osterreicher, their attorney, uh, covering an, a number of different cases of of police usually arresting journalists and then dismissing the charges later, but in the process, getting them away from the story and violating, in our opinion, their, their First Amendment rights. And I've been a number of panels with Harlow as well, uh, who is uh, one of the best advocates out there on digital safety. We've been very busy. We train a number of news organizations in, uh, uh, in how to handle civil unrest. We set up GJS to train journalists and aid workers who are operating overseas, places like Afghanistan, or not, or Kenya or Venezuela, uh, but now uh, the situation in the United States. This is worse than anything I've ever seen in my career, and I'm almost 60 uh, in terms of uh, attacks on the press. And this is the worst time for journalists in the history of the United States, going back at least to the Civil War. We've never seen uh, attacks like this so systematic against the press. Uh, police opening fire with rubber bullets and uh, pellet balls, which led one journalist to lose sight in her left eye, um, and a number of other people have been injured. So I'm very glad to be here and thank you for having me. Well, thank you all so much for joining. Um, Alan, I believe you'll probably handle a lot of these questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to you um, and you can explain a little bit about what's going on Twitter as well. We're trying something new this week. We are going to be live tweeting uh, on our Twitter account at Photoshelter if you wanna follow. And uh, a good reason to do that is we'll be sharing a number of links, uh, external resource links, uh, some from the organizations that are represented here today, some from various news articles, uh, safety articles, et cetera, that you might find uh, interesting. I should also mention that this session is being recorded. So if you need to drop out uh, and come back later, you can find this uh, webinar being posted on our blog at blog.photoshelter.com. But without further ado, let's go ahead and start. All right. One second, there we go. So uh, I know that a lot of people that are joining today are concerned about their physical safety, about their data security. So let's just jump in with uh, this question. What preparatory steps should photographers take before they cover a protest? Frank, do you wanna tackle that first? Yeah, that's very important. Uh, the, the one thing that I think is absolutely essential, and this is tricky for photographers, but uh, having eye protection would be important. Of course, how you navigate eye protection with the viewfinder is going to be a challenge. But I'm concerned about photographers being and other journalists being out there without being able to protect their eyes, which again, for photographers is a challenge, but I think it's something people want to think about. I think you want to think about the clothes you're wearing. So you why do I, you want to look like a journalist, you don't want to look like a protester, but at the same time, um, and identifying yourself as press, but you don't want to stand out too much either, right? We've had uh, a number of different incidents. In some cases, some, some uh, in a few cases, protesters have also attacked the press, including a Fox News crew. I think people have to be mindful of, of what they're wearing, and I think people need to think about bringing water to help uh, deal with tear gas, I would suggest getting some menthol rub and putting that underneath your eyes, the way athletes put charcoal there to cut down on glare, because it helps the tear ducts uh, open up, uh, which can keep things flowing. And if you do um, get exposed to tear gas, remember not to rub it, because it's a powder-based substance that can be activated from rubbing and or from your sweat. So carrying some water uh, is good for hydration, but also in case you get gassed. Harlow, do you have uh, security, data security tips before people are going to a protest? I know a lot of people are concerned about cell phones. Yes, um, so we can talk in depth about cell phones, 
Um, uh, so there's, as a journalist, you might want to um, make sure that um, actually the, the footage that you take um, is uh, the most important thing to be protected. And so uh, that gives you like a, a little bit of a double-edged sword because on one end, you definitely do want to make sure that you are connected if you're filming with, you know, a, a just a cell phone, um, but also be aware of the fact that as you are, let's say, streaming to whatever platform that it is um, where you're going live, um, you're also uh, emanating a lot of data about, you know, who you are um, because that, uh, um, that SIM card in your phone is probably, you know, uh, connected to your personal identity. So you could be targeted on site or um, um, retaliated against afterwards based off of that metadata that, you um, that you're giving off. But that said, the point of being out there is to witness. And so that might be um, something that you have to contend with uh, and understanding that um, even though we, we know that there's so many cases of retaliation against journalists and um, um, professional and citizen journalists alike, um, that that might be a cross that you have to bear. Um, if, uh, and understanding that you do have legal representation, um, but that said, I'm not going to be Pollyanna-ish about um, uh, how hard it would be uh, in the case of, of such retaliation. Um, there are ways to outfit a phone um, so as to, to kind of, um, uh, I guess, mitigate the possibility of personally identifying information wafting out into the air like so much tear gas um, when, when you are covering a, a protest. Um, if you're not going to go that route, uh, I've also seen um, some really, really intrepid journalism uh, that uh, has to do with like more involved, um, like kind of TV station equipment that does perform live streaming um, and that you can uh, get to consultation for. Um, if that is like within your means as far as resources in, are concerned. Um, and finally, uh, I, we understand that like device seizure, whether it's a phone or, you know, a, a, like a DSLR or um, some uh, like a, a video recording equipment uh, is something that we have to contend with. Um, and so if uh, in the event of um, device seizure or like someone um, uh, destroying a device, understanding uh, where or how to like exfiltrate your, you know, like let's say compact flash cards and understanding that there are forensic tools out there to recover it. Um, in some cases, uh, should someone attempt to delete your footage. I've seen some suggestions that people should disable the, the face ID to unlock their phone, the fingerprint ID to unlock their phone, or even use a burner phone. What, what is sort of the common uh, advice that you give people at a very basic level? Um, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll take that as well. Uh, no. So <clears throat> definitely um, uh, while, okay, so face ID um, is real or biometric ID, touch ID, however you have it, uh, can come in handy, really, really handy uh, if you are under duress and you absolutely need to, you know, unlock your phone to call someone, a friend, a lawyer, family member, someone who has your back. Um, however, it's not recommended to um, go into uh, uh, into the field like that with that enabled. Uh, the reason why is uh, because you can be physically compelled very easily to unlock something that has biometrics set up. Um, however, it's a lot harder for someone to take you aside and actually get you to communicate a passcode in order to unlock a phone. Um, we can get into like the strength of that passcode a little bit later on, um, but that is also something to think about. Um, but uh, understand that um, you do have, you know, like certain maneuvers on um, the majority of phones that are in um, our hands as Americans that actually allow you to clear that touch ID um, very, very simply. So that means the next time you um, want to actually open up your phone, uh, you are going to have to type in that passcode in order to access, you know, your user features. And finally, um, the um, good thing about uh, being in lockdown mode, which is what it's called on Android specifically, um, is that whether, whether you're on an iPhone or an Android, you still do have the ability to, you know, with a swipe, um, uh, open up your camera uh, and start recording immediately. Achille, moving on to the next question, you know, you've worked uh, as a photojournalist, you've worked as a photo editor, and now as executive director of the National Press Photographers Association. I'm sure this is 
come up uh, more recently because of the emergence of facial recognition tools. Uh, we've seen a lot about a company called Clearview AI uh, in the past six months and how uh, peaceful protesters can be put into law enforcement uh, databases without their knowledge, even before committing a crime. So this very fundamental question, which was not controversial at all five years ago, has now become controversial. Should photojournalists show protesters' faces? I think uh, if they are in public and they are uh, not trying to hide their identity, I think it's very important that we do, if that person gives permission. We don't really need permission, but I think it's very important to educate the public that we're there to document history. And in a way, our presence there protects more than it harms. Um, we have been on the front lines of documenting police brutality to citizens exercising their rights to uh, protest. That is a fundamental American uh, right in our constitution. So, and it's been, a, uh, it's been a force of change in our society for having people out there protesting the wrongs of our society. So I think it, the question has to be asked, what is the purpose of being out there as a protester? And it's, it's important to show the strength in numbers. And I think it's also important to connect to the humanity and the, the diversity of people who are engaged in this level of protest. Now, if you are concerned about your identity, I think there are steps people can take to, to obscure it. If there's things that are going on that might uh, cause legal issues, I think that is also a question of bringing it to the courts because, again, it's a fundamental right for citizens to protest. Now, I understand there's been questions of concerns of harm to uh, protesters. Uh, and I think that if there is a concern for yourself, whether it's for uh, jail or physical harm from police, I think that there are other ways for you to protest if you cannot, if you're not willing and able to get out there and show. And I, I don't think, unless you're doing something obtrusively, if you're up close and personal, my uh, when you I ask people for their names, you know, are why are you here? And that is almost an, a, a tactical agreement to, between the photographer and the subject that they are here and they're aware that their photographs are being uh, taken. So it's kind of a, a contradictory kind of um, uh, position to be put in sometimes because you're out there in public in a public space, and so there really is no expectation of privacy there. And I think it is a powerful statement to make that you are here. This is a face of protest. And I feel, feel very strongly about that. I, I mean, when you think about the photographs from the 60s, the pictures of dogs and fire hose turned on protesters, pictures of, of the police beating up like John Lewis and people on the marching, the March on Washington and other marches, those people put their, literally put their bodies on the line to effect change. And I think as photojournalists, we were there to help push that message. It wasn't until seeing those a lot of those images that people were shocked by the horror of what we were living under, those conditions we lived under. So I think that is the role of a photojournalist to document history as it's happening. Frank, do you have any concerns in regards to physical safety for both photographers and participants at, at protests regarding being able to use facial recognition or IDing people at all? You know, I think that, uh, as Aliki said, I think it's it's up to protesters if they don't wish to be uh, captured on images uh, still or, or moving video, they need to take measures to protect themselves. I don't think that's necessarily the responsibility of, uh, of the photographer or the videographer. And I think uh, protesters need to be aware that police will also be taking photographs and will also be taking video and using closed circuit television uh, footage if something were to occur. So everybody needs to be aware of that. I think that uh, the important thing for journalists is to make sure that the pictures they are taking have a news value. They're not just taking pic pictures of people's faces for, for any other purpose other than to capture what's actually happening. And that means they have the right to photograph protesters as well as police. And from a journalistic standpoint, you can't discriminate against one or the other. If the police want to be obscured, they can pull their, their shield down. But if they're out there in, in a public manner 
everybody has everybody in in that space should expect to be photographed. We don't need people saying you don't have any right to photograph us. No, we have a right to photograph you no matter who you are, police or protesters. If you don't want to be photographed, stay home. Uh, I that. also I like yeah. to add something to the question about your data uh, in the process of uh, uh, covering events like this. As someone who's actually been in the, in the streets under duress, I've, there's tricks to hiding your uh, data. I mean, I uh, do the switch and bait, the bait and switch all the time. As soon as I find myself being under uh, purview by the, hold on, excuse me, can you mute me for a moment, please? Sure. Sure, one second. Um, um, in the meanwhile, I, there is something uh, uh, before we get into data and talk more about um, visuality. Uh, we have also started to see that um, law enforcement uh, has been requesting to view footage um, taken by reporters uh, on the scene in order to use that for um, uh, in order to use that to further like investigate and, and prosecute members of the public who had been attending, which is uh, really, really alarming. And uh, also, if the intent is to publish or the intent is to stream, you know that they have access to that anyway. So like part of me believes that that is actually just an intimidation tactic, but it is something that is happening. Okay, and, and that is one of the primary missions of uh, MPPA. Um, you should have Mickey Osterreicher's number on speed dial <laughs> as a, your emergency contact because one of the things we fight all the time is the tension of uh, photojournalists. And um, uh, actually just a couple of months ago, we had a young uh, student member who was uh, attempting to cover the protests in Hong Kong and got detained at the uh, Hong Kong uh, International Airport. And he called me in the middle of the night and I was able to call Mickey. And through Mickey's work, I uh, was able to contact the, uh, the embassy and we got the kid home uh, wow. safe. So those Great. are things, I mean, Mickey can be called almost, and Alicia can be called in the middle of the night. And uh, um, we work with, um, there was cases in Ferguson, Mickey went to Ferguson and was uh, getting people out of jail. So uh, for journalists that were being unlawfully detained. And we also have, um, we, were, we did it in the last presidential um, convention uh, elections and we were planning on doing it this year if they have them or not, but Mickey actually works with the uh, local, lo local and federal and uh, state law enforcements prior to both the Democratic and the uh, Republican conventions, educating law enforcement about interacting with protesters in the right way and the wrong way and what the rights of journalists are. And uh, we just recently, uh, it's just announced yesterday, we've joined with the um, Press Freedom Defense Fund uh, uh, out of a program called First Look Media to uh, support our advocacy for journalists who have been arrested and injured. And um, we basically uh, have a, a multifaceted uh, uh, initiative. I gave links to, uh, to Photo Shelter there that we'll be able to share with the public, but it's on our website. But uh, we'll be able to ensure journalists arrested in protests have sufficient legal defense through pro bono counsel or funds to pay for their legal defense. Uh, we're gonna be training journalists about their first minute rights to record and report as well as ethics, safety, and security during events such as this. Uh, we are identifying partners in law school clinics across the country to provide support in these areas. And we're creating a resource list of lawyers who do criminal defense work for journalists in various jurisdictions, include, including pro bono cases and engaging in strategic litigation to defend journalists' established First Amendment rights to cover demonstrations, police, acti public police activity, and civil or unrest. So these are ongoing uh, even prior to this uh, partnership we just announced yesterday, but this is something a, a primary function of what uh, MPPA has been doing over the years is protecting and advocating the rights of visual journalists. Uh, it, it was it's completely a, a shock to, <laughs> shocking to me to find out the level of ignorance law enforcement has on their own level of the rights of citizens to be able to do their jobs, uh, whether you're a citizen or a credentialed news uh, journalist, uh, but there are rights that they uh, <laughs> trample over on a daily basis. So part of it, we're working also with a, um, uh, 
partnering with law enforcement's ongoing education and negotiation with them on how to um, work with journalists and protests. Um, and more recently, just just actually just the other day, um, I found out I did hadn't realized Atlanta was one of the few cities uh, in of the major protest areas that was not exempt from the curfews that police had enacted. And I alerted Mickey about that, and he was able to contact someone within the uh, uh, city of Atlanta uh, attorney's office. And it just so happens that same morning, uh, the the only uh, black staff photographer uh, for the Atlanta Journal Constitution, Elisa Pointer, had been arrested and detained by the police because they did not, even with her her press credentials, did not believe she was a uh, journalist. And it took two white broadcast journalist colleagues who knew her and uh, were familiar with her work around the city, who had to. Uh, make the plea for her to say that she yes this is a working journalist she's with the ajc and they eventually had to let her go and and later that day um the, the atlanta city attorney's office released the note that journalists were exempt from curfews and being arrested i should editorialize on that the announcement that nppa made that you can find on their website at nppa.org but that is that is a, an amazing set of uh, offerings, uh, legal offerings by those organizations. And um, it's definitely another reason if you are a working photojournalist to support and join NPPA. Uh, moving on to the next question, Harlow, what are some digital safety non-negotiables for journalists? Um, well, we did talk about that passcode issue. Uh, yeah. Non-negotiable uh, is, to definitely like make sure that uh, you know um, that uh, if your phone is seized and finds itself in like a locker or something like that, there are tools that might assist um, uh, law enforcement to um, unlock your phone. And so the uh, more robust your the passcode that you use, like it should be alphanumeric, it should not be like, you know, a six digit pen, anything like that, um, that should be applied immediately. And we did talk about the biometrics there. Um, there are a couple of other hardening tips that a lot of people um, kind of take for granted uh, when they get a new iPhone, you know, you just open it up and it just works and you pop in your iCloud and there you go. Um, but uh, there are a number of hardening tips that I recommend, such as uh, going through like, you know, the, the settings app in that touch ID and passcode or, you know, uh, face ID and passcode uh, settings and, you know, making sure that you don't have, um, <clears throat> or that you have uh, data erasure turned on um, and that you uh, don't allow USB um, uh, uh, equipment to interact with your device um, explicitly without your say so. So that's one thing. Um, I can think of a couple of others if you give me a moment. Yeah, I, I wonder if you could also address, you know, we are so reliant on uh, geolocation and GPS capability of phones nowadays. You know, I, I probably use Google Maps 10 times a day. Um, and as useful yeah. it can be navigating the streets, is that a threat mm -hmm. to journalists? Um, so what's threatening, it depends on how you look at it, but ultimately what might be threatening about it is uh, the way that that's stored on cloud platforms like iCloud or um, or Google or with your Google account. And so, uh, and also it's not just GPS that um, uh, is part of your, uh, or of like, you know, the locations that you're um, accumulating, but it's also things like, you know, uh, visible Wi-Fi signals and even in some cases, Bluetooth. And so uh, you might, I definitely do think that it's worth understanding that the different radios that you have on, not just your GPS, um, contribute to uh, your getting location fixes. Uh, under normal circumstances, like when you're driving and you're trying to find your way, that can come in really, really handy. Um, however, if you find yourself in a place where you, um, you know, put your phone in airplane mode because you don't want, like, you know, to your telephony to work, but you still have Wi-Fi on and you might be communicating with something else that um, grabs uh, your your um, identifying information, that those are things to contend with. Um, uh, ultimately, you did mention burners, and I intentionally um, uh, didn't answer that because having a burner phone um, is, well, two things. One, uh, it's not always, um, it's 
not always feasible. I, people don't always have like, you know, an extra like $700 to make sure that they have a nice phone that's just for going into a situation where it might be seized or smashed. Um, and also, uh, um, uh, people tend to think of burners as like, you know, something that you use once and toss it away, but actually um, what you, what, rather than calling it a burner, you just might want to have a phone that doesn't necessarily have any um, uh, meaningful linkage to the rest of your life, meaning that, uh, you know, it doesn't have a decade's worth of my Gmail history on it. Um, stuff that if in the event of my phone being seized could be used against me for some other reason. So don't think of it as a burner, like, you know, you use it once and you throw it away, but think of it as a compartmentalized space where you just have like access to the things you need to get the job done. Thanks. Um, shifting to kind of, actually, I, I didn't have it on a slide, but Frank, if you could address uh, you, you mentioned the, the eye protection for photographers moving into these protest areas. Are there other physical safety non-negotiables from your standpoint? I saw one shocking thread on Facebook where someone said, should should photojournalists carry mace with them just in case they're attacked? Um, what are your thoughts no. in regards to physical safety? Absolutely not, right? Um, carrying mace, carrying any sort of any sort of weapon is just, is a is a no go for journalists covering this. That's only going to get them in trouble, and it's not going to help anyone. Um, what I'm concerned about here is, and something that Mickey and I have discussed from NPPA for a long time, is is police routinely arrest journalists to get them away from the site. It's a violation of your First Amendment rights, but they do it all the time. And what journalists need to know, and if you watch the video of the CNN journalist Omar Jimenez being arrested. He did exactly what we train journalists to do. You have the right to cover the story, but the police have the right to restrict where you are able to operate from. They may, they have the right to tell you to move and the courts have upheld that. So when a journalist is confronted by a police officer, it's important to do what Jimenez does, which say, officers, we're reporting, are we okay here? Just tell us and we'll move. And to make sure you record that on camera, that somebody's getting a videotape of that. And they can tell you to move, then you move. Then you say, have we moved far enough? They can tell you, you got to keep moving. Have we moved far enough? It's a cat and mouse game. And it gets a little ridiculous, but it's absolutely necessary. Because what happens is then people get arrested. And invariably, when journalists get arrested, unless they are charged with resisting arrest, which is a, a felony and a big problem, right? If there's any evidence of that, usually there is not. They, they just arrest you, they get you off the scene, and then the, the charges are dismissed hours or, or the next morning after people spend the night in jail, and people like lawyers like Mickey or, or news, news supervisors end up getting them released. And the problem is, is you miss the story. So what I think what journalists need to understand is legally, courts have not upheld that journalists necessarily have any real right to be there beyond what public citizens have. They have some administrative privileges as essential workers in this context, but those are limited. So when a police officer wants you to move, you have to move. What the police cannot do is not give you a warning and then smash you with a baton or spray, hit you with pepper balls or pepper spray, or just arrest you without warning. So you wanna make sure you cover that. And it's very important in this environment that you know photojournalists and videographers get over their competitive instincts, which I know is difficult. I'm, you know, I'm a reporter too, but to cover each other. And the way you cover each other is somebody films an interaction when someone else is having an interaction with police or on those rare occasions when it's occurred, protesters in, these, in this environment. But police really have taken the notion that journalists don't have a right to be there. We have a right to be there, but you have to be responsive to police orders and you have to be demonstratively responsive to police orders. And that's extreme. You may get arrested anyway, but you'll have a much better chance. And filming it, the more it's, the more we show police opening fire point blank without warning on journalists with pepper balls or with, or with rubber bullets or arresting them for no reason other than they want to get them out of there, it helps, it helps journalists and it helps the cause of press freedom to document that. So people just work together and be mindful of how to interact with police. And if they arrest you, do not resist, do not argue, right? Anything you do then will be used against you. Yes, yes, I'm complying officer. Yes, I'm putting my hands behind my back officer, right? 
uh, because they want to jack up those charges. That's how they try to protect themselves. And we've really got to work together as a community of journalists to deal with this problem. If you're joining us midway, we are live tweeting uh, at Photo Shelter on Twitter. You can find uh, links to a number of resources about the questions that we're asking. Achille, it's not an exaggeration to say that you're one of the trailblazers of uh, black female photojournalists in the United States. Uh, on our next question, what extra precautions should people of color or women photojournalists take to stay safe? Uh, well, <laughs> my background is a little unusual. I'm a daughter of a Marine, <laughs> one of three, matter of fact. Uh, my dad uh, was overseas quite often, so in order for his daughters to, for him to feel to protect, his daughters be protected, he had us all trained in karate. <laughs> so I was a martial artist from like middle school through high school. And uh, I'm also a tall, fairly physically imposing woman, so I use that to my advantage in many ways. But also as I got, to, as things get dangerous, I, I like working with a partner. I partner often with reporters and having a white reporter actually helped me in a lot of cases. And then I helped them because I gave them access to areas they could not help. Uh, these days as an independent, I actually have three grown sons <laughs> and big, and I take them with me. <laughs> like I was, I was doing some coverage for the AJC uh, over the weekend. And I just have what, one of my sons with me. I said, just, just watch my back. And um, uh, frankly, I have, there has been some definite um, tones of uh, protesters seeing photographers as a threat. And um, before I left the Bay Area, and it's still ongoing even before the protest uh, issues came up, where photographers were being uh, jumped and in in gear stolen. And so, again, working with a partner, someone who can walk, watch your back is, is always a really great alternative. I also, that uh, monopod is a, is a nice equivalent to a... <laughs> equivalent to a policeman's baton, not to use against the police, no, but to people who, who are trying to physically intimidate and or get at you. But actually, I have found ways is better to de-escalate a situation versus trying to, you know, unless someone's just outright wanting to attack you uh, on a surprise note, it is better to really de-escalate a situation. I was in Los Angeles during the uh, LA uprisings of, after Rodney King verdict. And, um, I actually couldn't even get home that night because I was working on the desk for the Associated Press. And uh, my husband actually at the time was working, was still a working pressman for the LA Times. So neither one of us were at home. We had uh, family members looking after our kids. And, uh, but as I, uh, as the phone lines went down, I actually had to just get home to just make sure my family was safe. I had my cameras with me and I started doing some coverage um, that night myself. And there was, uh, looting starting to go on and I was shooting some of that and um, and you know your awareness of people around you you're not really sh sh uh, focusing specifically on a particular person's face or not when there's like a mob of crowds coming at you or one past you and this all of a sudden this one big intimidating fella was just about six foot five was up in my face saying did you take my picture did you take my picture and I'm like you know, bro, I don't know. I may have, I may not have, I don't know. I says, but if I come across it in my film, I'd be, I'll be sure not to use it. And I actually gave him my business card. I says, look, if you have any issues or anything you see, and this is film days and so it's all print. So if you have any issues, please feel free to contact me. And, and also fortunately, a young woman was with him um, as I also worked black press long before I got into mainstream press, I was a pretty known figure around the community. And she just pulled on and said, hey, bro, this is, she's been around. She, she, she's part of the community. Leave her alone. So, you know, that helped a lot. But if you can, you really want to try and engage and just say, look, we're just here trying to tell the story. We're trying to tell your story. And not that we're not here to take, uh, you know, try to get you in trouble. But we really want to document whether this, the, what is the, point of why you're out here in the streets. So. Frank, you have emphasized in the past when you're training with your, your firm, Global Journalist Security, uh, about de-escalation and de-escalation techniques. When, if a photographer is approached by someone who's not with law enforcement and tries to attack that photographer, what what's sort of the, the standard advice that you give journalists? Well, as, uh, as Akili said, uh, de-escalation is absolutely essential. Uh, that's something that we create scenarios and we put photographers through scenarios where they're being 
accosted by various people, uh, civilians playing different roles, law enforcement, and de-escalation is always in your interest. That doesn't mean you roll over and you let somebody punch you in the face to steal your camera or destroy it, right? It's about getting yourself in a position where you're protecting your own body, protecting your own equipment, you're moving towards safety, but you're not swearing at anybody. You're not throwing out any, any F-bombs or anything to make a situation worse. And you're also starting to raise your volume of, while you're attracting attention from other people saying, hey, I'm here taking pictures. That's all I'm doing. Please back off, right? And then people will hopefully turn and protect you because we've got to think about our solidarity is among with other, other members of the press. I also applaud Achilles uh, having taken martial arts. We teach non-striking maneuvers in all of our hostile environments classes, how to get away if somebody grabs your arm or your wrist, right, or even your hair or your ponytail, and to do it in a non-striking way, but in a way that gets you out and leaves and gets you even with, a, with it before the person even realizes what happened, they've lost their grip and you're already two steps away and moving further right? Those kind of skills are essential. And practicing de-escalation techniques and having some non-striking skills, but skills that allow you to escape from somebody trying to manhandle you is really quite important. Yes, it's better to be overrun than to stand there and argue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, we've touched on it a little bit, but uh, a press pass if you can get it in certain jurisdictions nowadays, seems to confer very little protection and can actually make photographers a target. Is there, uh, do you have additional tips for any of you in regards to, you know, if you are identified as press already by a badge or by, you know, a, a vest or something, are there additional tips that photographers and photojournalists and videographers should be taking while they're out in the field? Look, getting credentials, I think, is absolutely important, if I may, right? I think that's that's key. You can hang the credentials from your neck. You can also stuff it inside your shirt when you need to. Most of the time in this situation, I think there's a more of an advantage to letting people know you're press. So the protesters don't think you're an undercover police officer. And the police know you're not a protester with a camera, which also occurs. You are a bona fide uh, journalist, right? That doesn't mean citizen journalists don't also have the right to be recording things. We wouldn't be here if it weren't citizen journalists that had recorded uh, uh, the killing on live uh, of, of George Floyd right in Minneapolis. So we have to respect that as well. But having credentials is important. You want to display them. You want to display them in a way that they're not easily ripped off your neck. There are ways of securing them or maybe getting a vest that says press. You may wish to conceal that, but I think most of the time and what I've seen over the past several weeks here in the United States as this thing has escalated, uh, or two weeks, really. It's only been that long. Um, it's good. It's good to have credentials and display them. Yeah, like we don't actually issue credentials. We have what we call a press ID as a part of a that you purchase as a member of the MPPA, and uh, we're very explicit on our um, page that this is not a credential, but it recognizes you as a member of the National Press Photographers Association, and um, by conferring the fact. Uh, that you are a working professional photographer. And we also, like I said, you can either hang it for your, your neck, but there's also a, 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 a provided by Think Tank, we have uh, the credential holder, which actually can be put on your belt. Uh, I agree totally with Frank. It's, I, it's better to have one than you can hide it if necessary, if it makes you a target, but you could present them to police or to whatever law enforcement's in place to give you a, a level of legitimacy that not having one may not. Uh, provide, but it's still a dicey situation. I mean, you you have to kind of really um, determine what uh, what the situation is you're in. Um, uh, another uh, link that I provided to to you all, uh, we have a safety uh, uh, chair part of our uh, group, uh, Chris Post, who offers really solid advice on situational awareness. Uh, for photographers. And if you get a chance, please look up that link. We offer a lot of different resources. But Chris Post has been very been also very good about helping us train other photographers how to be aware, how to look after themselves, and how to get in and out of situations. And I think you have to be, as a working photojournalist, working in different difficult situations, whether it's protests or war conflict, you have to really develop your uh, uh, instincts of what's going on around you. Uh, get you can be completely caught up in shooting what it's before 
around you, but you have to have your awareness what's going on behind you and to your sides. And it's it's a acquired skill sometimes, but if you you really have to be ready to to uh, do things to take care of yourself while you're out in the field. Harlow, I want to pivot back to some of the digital security for uh, a few minutes. And in regards to you know we've we've heard in the press. Um, about things like encryption, end-to-end -end encryption. We've, you know, the whole uh, controversy around Zoom having end-to-end -end encryption and how people should be communicating. A lot of people have heard, oh, Signal is a really good way to use end-to-end -end, uh, encryption. Of the sort of readily available non-command line based tools that, that are out there, are there ones that you recommend for communications for photographers? Um uh, yes. Uh, so, I mean, definitely Signal is the gold standard right now as far as um, providing end-to-end -end communication. Uh, <laughs> I can imagine that, uh, and uh, there actually was um, a graph that I had seen from one of those companies that monitors, you know, uh, um, installs on any particular app. Uh, there has been a, a several hundred percent spike in insults for signal um, as people are going out into demonstrations over the past couple of weeks, which is a good thing. Um, however, signal, uh, so signal is an amazing app. Um, I rep it uh, entirely, but I do want to um, underscore the fact that we are living in a very, very peculiar time, one that we have not seen yet in, in the United States. But we have, um, if people had been paying attention, we had seen um, a number of flashes abroad uh, where uh, um, law enforcement will have the tools in order to prevent people from communicating because ultimately um, communicating with end-to-end -end encryption uh, effectively is one of the most threatening things to authoritarian regimes. Um, and so if we find ourselves in a place of martial law, it is not at all 100% unlikely that we will try, uh, that we will see attempts of, um, you know, any type of communication platform that works very well for us being um, uh, somehow like, uh, not tampered with, but like preventing people from accessing it. So uh, at Freedom of the Press Foundation, one thing that we do like to teach people is not necessarily like to use this tool, use it all the time, um, because, uh, if there, if, if that tool is a single point of failure, then you might find yourself um, voiceless. And so uh, the reason why we love Signal is because it um, provides uh, um, cryptographically sound, tested, and proven end-to-end -end communication, which means that um, you are under um, the, situ the, the situation that Signal provides for you, uh, your the content of your communication cannot be intercepted and read. Um, that said, there are other uh, services out there that provide similar things. So Signal also gave us not only this app, but also this really, really amazing protocol that ensures this cryptography. And that can be found in things like Wire, um, which is another app that um, uh, is incredibly useful. Uh, that can be found in WhatsApp. Um, that can be found even in the secret chat function of Facebook Messenger. Uh, however, uh, that reveals like all, all other, you know, sorts of, of uh, <laughs> uh, challenges given, you know, like how those apps are made, especially because the latter two that I mentioned are made by Facebook. So your mileage may vary. But if you're prioritizing having a confidential conversation where you can, with, you know, the, the group of people who have your back, um, continue to, to, you know, continue your mission, um, then choosing uh, something that has those criteria um, is more important than choosing any particular tool. And so it's our job to kind of evangelize this, like, use Signal, it's rad, like, I use it all day, every day. Um, that said, understand that if, you know, like, circumstances are so extraordinary that you have to pivot, have the knowledge in your head in order to improvise another solution. Hey, Harlow, um, would you recommend GoTenna as an investment for people to be able to I, keep oh, block? OMGs. I love it. Okay, um, thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, I do really, really love GoTenna. And actually, I have one in front of me right now. If I were on video, I would show you. Um, <laughs> so uh, GoTenna is a really, really um, admirable uh, um, project that 
uh, in, well, well, first and foremost, what it, it, where it's different from, you know, the communication apps that we use, like Signal and WhatsApp and all these things, you're ultimately speaking to a server in order to communicate your messages. There's no getting around the fact that as you're walking around these streets and you are texting, you know, coordinates with your friends, your phone is saying to, you know, your, your phone provider, whether that's like Verizon or, you know, Sprint or whatever, they're saying, hey, I'm going to, you know, like uh, signal.org and I keep going to signal.org. Um, and uh, that um, means that these are not really decentralized communications. Um, Gotenna is a piece of uh, a really, really excellently engineered um, piece of hardware. They are uh, antenna, uh, they're uh, wide range antennas that cover, um, I believe, uh, like 200 meters um, and actually uh, uh, perform very, very well in, um, you know, like close urban scenarios like these. Uh, and it's, you know, it, because it's radio, um, you actually don't need to um, to connect to a central server. So there is an app that you would install. They have one for Android and for iOS. Um, you have these antenna, these physical antennas that you are, are um, manufactured in a way that you could loop them somewhat securely. You might want to um, reinforce the, um, the the antennas to you know your bag or your clothing or whatever um, as you walk around, so you don't lose them or whatever, um, so they're not damaged. Um, so you can actually do uh, communicate do um, uh, urban communications with folks without actually having to hit a centralized server. So these are um, actually marketed for uh, EMTs, for mountaineers, um, you know, for for people who, uh, uh, yeah, for people who do like crisis response. But it's also like really, really useful um, in situ situations like these, especially if you need to like coordinate within um, uh, with a team. Uh, so the bad news is, um, is that, well, there's two pieces of bad news. One is that you have to drop about 175 bucks for a pair of two of these antennas. Um, and also, um, uh, good luck. Um, I, I mean, I don't know what our supply chain looks like right now, but given the, the, the crisis that we are also living in, um, that has ravaged our supply chain and our delivery. And so it's kind of hard to improvise it. Um, but, uh, yeah, Gotenna, I highly rep them. Gotenna, thank you. You know, there's been major shifts in the industry. Uh, a lot of the full-time positions in photojournalism have been shifted to freelance. Um, so for our next question, what should photographers in general, but particularly freelancers do if they are detained or arrested? Frank, you already said, definitely do not resist arrests. Try to comply as much as possible. But after the cuffs are on and you've been taken down and you know in the paddy wagon down to the the precinct and to jail, what should photographers be doing? They should uh, they should have the phone numbers of uh, an editor who would vouch for them, uh, available and either committed to memory or on a piece of paper. They may they will take your cell phone if you're arrested. They may take your wallet and your other possessions. So uh, we would recommend writing it down. And if you need to even sew it in your, into a pocket in your clothes or put it somewhere where they're not gonna find it. So if you get a chance to make a phone call, you call an editor who can vouch for you and you call Mickey, right? Osterreicher from the National Press Photographers Association. That's what, you know, Mickey's incredibly responsive and incredibly good, right? Um, and that's, you gotta be able to do that uh, or else you're, you know, because it'll, it'll quicken the time that you are finally, charges are hopefully dismissed as they almost invariably are and you'll get out of there. If not, you can end up spending, uh, being there overnight or for a long period of time, as we've seen in protests in the past. So have those numbers memorized or written down, not just on your phone, because your phone's gonna be taken away if you if you are uh, detained. I, I concur with Frank there, <laughs> definitely. Uh, it's always good to, I always make sure I carry a piece, of, a, a physical piece of paper of the assignment, if I'm out on assignment, but definitely have uh, your editor's numbers memorized and Mickey's numbers <laughs> memorized because Mickey will, like I said, he's very responsive. And uh, well, my, myself. You know, when a, when a photojournalist is arrested and, and the, their equipment, whether it's their cell phone or their cameras are, are seized by the police, upon their release, do the police give back that equipment right away or can they kind of stall that process as well? 
they have been known to stall, but they're supposed to release their gear. Uh, part of the problems, uh, some of the lawsuits we've been involved with is, is getting not only the gear back, but more importantly, your, your, your images, getting your uh, uh, cards back with your uh, assignments on them. Um, again, I learned a while ago to find different ways of hiding <laughs> my disc so that right. they're not, you know, so when they actually are ready to arrest you, you have a blank one inside your camera and that's the one they're taking. That's a lot of times. And if you have different little compartments in your, your shirts or jackets or shoes or whatever, find different places or someone you could hand see, you know, if you have someone you're working with who's out of the scene, get them to take it and, and go before you get, before you are taken in. But, uh, Legally, they don't have any rights, not only to take your uh, gear, they're not allowed to, they're not supposed to actually erase images and they open themselves up to lawsuits because of it, if they do. Incidentally, uh, Mickey's advising that people write those phone numbers with indelible ink on your arm. So that's another technique that you can use. <laughs> <laughs> The final uh, preset question that we have is actually something that Allegra Wild brought up. There have been uh, so many great images and videos that have been captured uh, during this time. Um, how should photographers handle usage requests and should they be giving these images and videos away for free? Achille Ramsey for uh, MPPA, what's your thought on that? No, that's one of my big... I think one of the first things, uh, one of the big transitions you've seen in our business as photographers go from staff to uh, freelance, or if you're just coming into the business of freelance, learn business skills, get some business training, but you're, do not give away your images. There is always a way to negotiate. Uh, you want to keep your copyrights. You want to be able to negotiate for fees um, and not just for uh, one-time use. Uh, you need to write out, a, have a standard contract you're ready to submit to anyone who wants to use your images. So, uh, and there's a lot of resources out there. Uh, we have a business calculator on the web, uh, MPPA website. Um, there's um, uh, a, a former uh, freelancer I used to work with the LA Times, Todd Bigelow has a really great business course that he uh, um, conducts throughout the years and sometimes at some of our workshops and um, there's a few other folks out there who are really business savvy uh, do what you can to learn your skills about negotiating uh, but never ever ever give away for free uh, I just don't believe in that and it's part of the process I think giving away images for free has, has been part of the process of devaluing the the, the value of experience and train uh, visual journalists and you're undermining your own ability to earn a living if you do so. Um, you're, having your photo credit does not pay your gas bill or your car, car note or your house or rent. So just think about that. There's no other business that I know of that literally gives away their ability to earn a living through their, and you think about the, trend, the amount of time you've spent learning, your education, the cost of your gear, and you want to give your images away for free to people who actually have millions of dollars to spend on content? Uh, no. <laughs> so learn the process, but don't give them away for free. Don't get excited and get caught up in the fact that you're getting your work published. Todd Bigelow is a good one to follow on Twitter. He's He actually had a, a tweet yesterday about a student photojournalist who's been licensing images from some of the protests. And again, even though you might have a specific feeling in regards to an emotional connection to the protest, that doesn't mean you are you should be giving away the content for free. Caitlin, let's take some uh, attendee questions. All right. Um, well, one has come up quite a bit, and uh, it's obviously, you know, in relation to COVID. So um, people are asking, you know, what steps or uh, things journalists should do to navigate the, the sort of dual threat happening, obviously from some of the violence that's happening at the protests, but also, you know, the threat of possibly contracting or spreading COVID-19. Before anyone answers, we should point out that none of the three people are healthcare professionals nor doctors, but they're smart and knowledgeable people, but we'll go for it, guys, if you have any thoughts on that. Well, mask up and have some hand sanitizer with you, right? I think those are the only things you can do, but make sure you do it. Mask up to protect other people and have hand sanitizer to protect yourself as needed, right? Um, I, think that's, I think that's the extent of it, but that's important. 
Yeah, those are basic. And uh, a lot of our broadcast uh, uh, colleagues have had to work with use the longer boom mics. You know, forget about the pure sound. These days it's better to be safe and have some uh, social distancing by interviewing, if at all possible. Uh, have some time to put disposable coverings for your mic if, if you need to really get up close and personal. But definitely mask up, glove up, um, just do all you can to keep yourself protected out there. I guess we should also point out that when you are assigned by an editor as a freelance photojournalist in particular, you ought to be demanding of that editor that they provide PPE for you. So even before all of this, the protest stuff happened, you should, if you were covering anything in the age of COVID, you should be demanding of your editor to have proper protection. I know that Reuters, for example, in certain, certain jurisdictions was also providing rental cars for their, their, uh, freelancers so that they didn't have to take public trans transportation is another way to uh, keep their photographers safe. It's really interesting because um, at the beginning of the whole co uh, COVID pandemic, when everything started getting shut down, um, a lot of uh, news organizations literally dropped right there and then the use of freelancers because of their fears of liability. I mean, it was just like, which is one of the reasons MPPA had an emergency uh, fundraiser for photographers. People literally lost their li livelihoods overnight because they weren't getting any work. Uh, but I was also, was also talking to groups of visual leaders who were concerned about their own staffs because they, weren't, they didn't have PPEs for their own staffs at the time. And we started working together to gather uh, necessary uh, masks that we were, uh, a, a couple of volunteers uh, uh, gave out to us that we were able to ship off to various uh, team news organizations and freelancers um, to be able to use. But now I think the supply chain has opened up a little bit and news organizations are being a lot more aggressive about providing gear uh, for both staff and freelancers. But uh, uh, the MPPA is like I said, working with a couple other volunteer groups that are volunteering, uh, uh, trying to procure equipment for us. But yes, you should make that a part. And I would also ask for hazard pay. You know, if you have a standard rate that you're used to getting from a particular organization, ask for a little extra because you're, you're not getting health benefits or anything from these organizations. But um, they know they don't have enough photographers out there right now. So, um, they might be able to, you might be able to negotiate that. But in the very least, and I, I know photographers um, who are also not covering events right now simply because they have compromised health issues and or family members that they don't want to uh, uh, make vulnerable to be exposed. So that this has been a, a very difficult time for visual journalists right now. Uh, it's a difficult Absolutely. question. Yeah. Another question, um, and. Sure. Um, so, you know, obviously everybody is um, concerned about tear gas. And this question is about how um, journalists can uh, protect their gear and, and just kind of an explanation of how tear gas may or may not affect phones and, and camera gear. Frank, any thoughts on the tear gas? Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, the problem is protecting yourself is one thing, protecting your gear is something else. It seems like one would need would want to bring some plastic covering or plastic bags to be able to put your camera in them when needed because tear gas is actually it's a powder that dissipates and I think that can really do a number on any any digital camera any camera um, so being able to protect it though I'm not sure uh, I'm not if it's I'm not a shooter I'm a scribbler so I'm not sure how photographers deal with that uh, myself yeah, I, I'm not absolutely sure as much either about the tear gas aspect. Um, uh, I think mentioned earlier for for your own physical protection, like uh, uh, goggles of any type that can help you. But um, uh, professional, a lot of professional photographers have weather gear that they use that could be probably improvised to use against that. And I'm just not sure how effective. I've been fortunate not to been the target of uh, it, engage in that type of coverage. Maybe Harlow has some information about that. Oh no, um, not particularly. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I also, uh, uh, carrying milk in a container seems to be another great alternative, especially if you get it in your eyes. Uh, it's better actually than water from what I understand. Uh, so, um, and uh, just some ways of wipe 
so you're not rubbing it into your eyes. Uh, but you have, as for your equipment, that's a, that's a very challenging question. I'm not really absolutely certain. If anyone has some uh -huh. secrets they're using, I'd be glad to hear about them. If you've joined us midway, just a reminder that we're live tweeting on Twitter with uh, a number of additional resources. If you want to take some of these uh, questions that we, we've asked, we've, we have more in-depth and detailed answers for you uh, with articles by some of the organizations that are represented here today. Another question, Caitlin. Sure. Um, this is from Jill, who's a student photographer. Um, she said that she's still in college and not an official member of the press. Um, she's asking if it's still possible to photograph protests and, um, you know, certain ways that she can kind of maintain her own safety as a student photographer. Uh, we have quite a few students out there covering protests. Uh, MPPA has a student uh, student level uh, membership, and we have student chapters across the country. And uh, we also offer uh, our press ID uh, available to students. So uh, I would, if you don't have, a, if you're at a school that's not affiliated with a, a chapter, try and find one, find one close to you because uh, you don't necessarily have to have one at your school, but I join up. Uh, but students are out there covering it. Uh, uh, schools with, um, I'm seeing some great student work uh, across the news feeds quite a bit right now. So don't, if you're able and willing to get out there, um, jump in if you have a, a, a way of participating. Um, Absolutely. Um, this is a great question from Charles. He asked if posting video and photos on you know, YouTube, social media, things like that, if that impacts the rights and potential sale of images, <laughs> which is a fun question. Uh, I don't know who, maybe Akili, you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, you still maintain your copyright. And if someone, uh, I would, if stills are a little easier to brand, but uh, because you could have, uh, you can have watermark or you could have your uh, imprint on each of the images, uh, broadcast, if you have your uh, credits embedded with your opening and closing, um, and if someone grabs, grabs your images and uses them, you can track them down basically. And uh, again, this goes back to having established business um, uh, structures for your own companies. Uh, just, and you don't have, and you don't have, even if you just uh, have it filed officially, you have a, a little bit of a leeway in time to file your copyright, but the sooner you can, the better. But even if someone uses your images before you actually have filed officially, you can sue against uh, uh, use, or at least you can ask for a takedown of any of your images being used without your authorization. I should step in there for a second too, because to me there are two parts of that. There's the one part regarding your intellectual property, and there's now some conflict, conflicting legal precedents that are out there. So some of you might be aware of the Stephanie Sinclair uh, case um, where her images were embedded from Instagram. Um, and one judge said it's okay because the sub-license agreement allows uh, companies to embed. And then last week there was another judgment that I was actually from, from my read and I'm corresponding with Alicia from NPPA that's in conflict with that. So there's some mm -hmm. questions around the embedding question specifically for Instagram and every situation and every platform is different. The other part that's interesting and maybe Harlow you can address this is that some of these organizations, social media organizations have agreements with law enforcement or they can be subpoenaed to give photo and video uh, content. Can you can you kind of talk yeah. about that a little? Um, it's not only content because I, I, I mean, of course, um, if you know someone had a, let's say private Instagram, uh, any user generated content is going to be subject to a subpoena. Um, quite frankly, for the content of um, stuff, if it's not behind a public Instagram or Facebook or whatever, and it's public, um, law enforcement actually have their own um, uh, or uh, their own departments where they just, you know, like the follow hashtags, look for photos of, of a certain type in order to use it. They don't even have to go through Facebook. That said, um, so one thing that is incredibly interesting that we have not yet brought up is the, um, the uh, issue of metadata. And uh, while if you are on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or any of these platforms, uh, the 
photo and video that you see will be scrubbed of its metadata. And the reason is mostly financial, actually. Um, so if you imagine you took like full resolution, um, you know, like beautiful 4K video or whatever, and then you posted it to one of these platforms, it would cost them so much more money for literally everyone that you that follows you to uh, download and view this in its original. And so what they do is they, um, you know, uh, they they uh, downsample um, a lot of, uh, uh, or sorry, they downsample every single bit of um, media that that people do post, and they have their own formats and own ways of doing that, you know, just automatically upon upload. Um, but that said, though, um, the metadata of any particular piece of media that you might submit to these platforms is saved. Uh, that is very, you know, it's pretty much just a bunch of text saying, you know, like what latitude and longitude a particular image was taken, what type of camera was it taken on, what was the serial number of the camera, even if that's part of it. Um, all of this metadata is retained by the platform. And actually, um, it was uh, discovered that, you know, Facebook um, had held courses with law enforcement agencies to teach them about how to request metadata. Uh, so they don't really even have to look at the picture. They can request metadata in order to like corroborate, you know, like the how and the when, um, you know, and all of the other journalistic questions about uh, any particular medium. Um, and so if that is, uh, so this is actually one of the reasons why an organization called Witness, um, which is a, a, um, a, a citizen uh, journalist outfit that works internationally um, does advocate people to like take a little bit of a pause before going directly to um, you know any of these platforms simply because uh, that metadata might be embedded and might have an impact um, down the line that you that is like as of yet unseen. Definitely great advice, um, Frank. This is probably a question for you because I know that you've done a lot of um, you know work overseas, so. Um, someone was asking about uh, kind of the laws around photographing police in a public place in the UK. I know that there have been a lot of, um, you know, other protests that are popping up. So I think a lot of our international photographers are kind of wondering what their rights are. Yeah, I, I can't speak to, uh, I haven't worked in the UK or look at the situation oh, yeah. in the UK. But I know um, in many countries, the law is just not an act. It's not a matter of law. It's just police do whatever they feel like, it, especially in less developed nations. And unfortunately, that mentality is now taking hold among police here. Very sad. Um, sorry, just bear with me one second. Just looking for a few more questions here. Um, if anybody has any other last minute questions, please feel free to send those our way. Um, I also, you know, while, while I'm kind of looking through the questions box, I just want to give all three of you, you know, a chance to, to say anything that maybe we didn't touch upon that you think is really important um, when it comes to, you know, to everyone's safety out there. Well, be careful. This is the worst. This is really unbelievable, right? This is the worst I've ever seen in any advanced nation, let alone the United States. And I got a feeling the guys with the guns that we we're out before uh, are t online talking about coming, opening fire on everybody out there, right? There was some sympathy for the protesters among the armed right-wing paramilitaries, but for everybody who's sympathetic, there's 10 posts that I've seen people who are critical. So this makes me nervous. The white supremacist groups are also looking at this and they see this as an opportunity to provoke a race war. So the potential for this to escalate, where we're going to look back on this period as just the beginning, is really quite real and palpable. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut anybody off. I just want to just say, be know your rights, um, be ethical. Uh, uh, MPPA has its own standard of ethics uh, that is generally accepted around uh, the world, actually, for, for most world journalists, but. <laughs> Just to know your rights is not enough to uh, put you in the right situation. So be careful, be aware, um, join an organization such as ours. It doesn't. I would prefer you join MPPA, but there are other organizations out there. There's, I think there is power in numbers. And the more people we have supporting what we do, the more we're able to do for photographers and other visual uh, journalists out there. Um, we have a lot of resources to offer as well as training. So I, I just want people to be careful and be, 
be honest with yourself about what you're trying to do out there. We're out there to tell a story and it's not about you, it's about what the subject is, what the story is, and you want to make sure you're you're covering it in an in-depth and understanding and full contextual way and not just to be out there to be in the middle of some kind of action. Uh, what we do impacts people's lives. So um, be thoughtful. Definitely. Um, I would like to say that um, I have the utmost respect and admiration for my uh, fellow panelists. Uh, they have a, a certain amount of expertise and um, uh, professional like history that I can only like ever dream to aspire to. Um, and uh, as much as I think everybody appreciates the perspective of a digital security professional, um, this I, I've always felt this and I'm always reminding myself of this, but this is a time where it comes into very, very clear relief. Um, how, uh, how limited this particular set of expertise goes. But that said, we are here for you. And right back at you, Harlow. Thank you. You offer some really valuable information that I wasn't even aware of. So all of it is uh, very, very good, and very much needed. Thank you both. Well, thank you all. Um, only a last little bit of housekeeping is um, all about our new guide, which was made in partnership with the wonderful team over at Authority Collective. Um, it's all about, you know, inclusive photography, and there is a really great section um, written on race that we encourage everybody to, uh, you know, just read through when you're going into these situations. There's plenty of things about gender, um, the LGBTQIA community. Um, so you can find that over on our homepage. If you just go to photoshelter.com and click the resources tab, you can download that for free. And we really encourage everybody, um, you know, to be ethical and also as inclusive as possible. Thank you to Achille. Thank you to Harlow. Thank you to Frank. Thank you to Allegra Wild for helping to put this together. And thank you to all the attendees. Uh, we will continue to, to live tweet. And if you have other resources that you want to share, please just reply to our tweets at Photo Shelter. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you at our next webinar. Take thank care. you so much, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Keith. Bye. Later. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>